Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. We thank you that you never change, that you have loved us from all eternity. And there's nothing we can ever do to change that love. You plan to love us until we reject you or we live with you forever. We thank you that you are doing everything possible to help us to understand and to receive what you have for us. We pray now that we will sense the hour we're living in, that we will know that we are in those moments in history that all the prophets look forward to. Help us to sense what a privilege it is for us to be your people now. We thank you for guiding us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. When uh, you live in the middle of something, you really don't notice too much of what's going on around you because you're in it all the time. I mean, what might seem unusual to somebody 15 years ago doesn't seem unusual at all to us. We see it all the time. Can you imagine if somebody showed up with their electric guitar a hundred years ago and walked into the Seventh Adventist Church and <laughs> but they do it today. I'm not going to give you any more examples. We just live with so much stuff today that has nothing to do with real living that we think it's normal. Ever since the end of the Second World War, this world has changed. Before that time, you did not see suburbs. You didn't see cookie-cutter houses. You did not see every house with the same refrigerator. You did not see every house with the same television set. You did not see every house with the same vacuum cleaner. With <laughs> the world has changed. The world of Alan White is gone. But there's something that's still here. The Roman Catholic Church. Ah, you weren't expecting that, were you? <laughs> well, you know what people say about that. The opinion, this is great controversy, 563... The opinion, I'm going to have to change this. I can't see this the way I have it set up. The opinion is gaining ground that after all, there we go, that's better. And now I have to find it again. <laughs> that after all, Rome is not so different as us after all. Well, is that true? Is the Catholic Church not so different from the churches of today? <laughs> There's not really a lot of differences there in most of the churches, including the Catholic Church, except the way their priests dress up and marry and a few other little things. But... But the churches of today and the churches in Ellen White's time, we're already doing it, are saying, those are little differences. Those are little teeny things. We should not be worrying about the differences. Let's get together on the things that are together. 
And of course, the churches in the world have things that they have together with the Roman Catholic Church, don't they? They all go to church on Sunday. <laughs> they all believe in the immortal soul. They believe in being saved in their sins. They've got lots of things they agree on. So it's no big deal to the churches about Catholicism. It's just another church. Of course, the Roman Catholics don't see it that way. They're the church, and everybody else is uh, somebody that left and has, has to come back. So with that little bit in great controversy, I don't need these. We know something's wrong. Did the Protestant reformers believe all that, that, that there's just a few little minor differences and everything's going to be okay? No. We just need to have some church socials together, that's all. <laughs> what did the reformers pay for being different? Yeah. yeah they paid. And do you know what they taught their children? All the reformers, real reformers, taught their children something. They told them, that's an abomination. That is not the church of Christ. It's an abomination. We are to abhor popery. Does anybody abhor popery today? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you see a picture of the Pope, and okay, that's the head of the Catholic Church. So what? So what if that president is bowing down? Suppose if that country is kissing his ring. Suppose it. <laughs> He's the head of the Christian Church. And if you read carefully the magazine articles and the newspaper articles, they call the Roman Catholic Church the Christian Church. when it is not even a Christian church at all. But who can you say that to walking up and down the streets? The Catholic Church is a counterfeit. It has nothing to do with Christianity. You get yourself shot. Somebody will run over you. <laughs> yeah. Even if they're atheists, they won't like it. Abhor popery. Martin Luther said, if I seek the judgment of the Pope, I deny Christ. Yeah. I deny Christ because I'm listening to the devil now. That's right. Let's get this down right. On page 50 of Great Controversy, it says the Bishop of Rome, the representative of Satan. That's the second angel's message. That's our message to the world. Oh, that's not nice. <laughs> you can't talk like that. That's not nice. You're fostering hate. <laughs> Why do you think the devil has raised these issues about homosexuals? He doesn't care about homosexuals. What, a, what does the devil care about homosexuals? He wants people to figure out we shouldn't hate anybody. Well, we shouldn't. But if you say you don't like homosexuality because the Bible condemns it, you're a hater. There's where the devil's going. He's trying to get everybody to think that if you are religious, you're a bigot. You are a hater. And if you say anything against the Roman Catholic Church, oh, <laughs> you're hating the wrong thing. What's the religion of the head of the Supreme Court? Does the Bible say that's going to happen? The head of the Supreme Court of the United States will take 
orders from the Pope when it comes down to the real issues. Both vice presidential candidates in this election are Roman Catholics. <laughs> are Roman Catholics involved? <laughs> Read, the head of the house is a Mormon. One of the presidential candidates is a Mormon. What's the difference between a Mormon and a Catholic? Both devil's churches. What is going on? Well, prophecy, that's what's going on. <laughs> God told us about all of this. But he said God's people are going to be a peculiar people. Different from everybody else. Really? <laughs> really? Who can look at our people today and say, boy, those are peculiar people. They're like nobody else we've ever seen. <laughs> well, we all have the same refrigerators, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we all have TVs. Well, yeah. Oh, we all dress the same. Oh, um. <laughs> but we know they're peculiar. The Bible said so. Disloyalty to God is what happens when we don't know what the papacy is. And we say so. Okay? We're supposed to say so. And we all know there's a price to pay for that one. We all know it. Reading from Great Controversy, have these persons forgotten the claim of infallibility put forth for 800 years? That was, we won't go into that right now. This claim, far from being relinqu uh, relinquished, was affirmed in the 19th century with greater positiveness than ever before. Rome asserts the church never erred and never can. Now, they believe that. And if they believe that, they means the only one that's wrong is guess who? <laughs> <laughs> they can't be wrong. That means that whatever they do is right. See? Well, with that kind of a thought, if anything they do is right, let's call you over here and let's chop off a toe or two to see if you want to be a Christian. And if you say you don't want to be a Christian, oh, well, let's take the foot. Not yet? Well, we need to save you. Let's chop off a couple of arms. <laughs> and let's keep going until you finally figure out you should be a Christian. A Roman Catholic, that is. Now, the people say who study these things, oh, that was in the Dark Ages. That was back when everybody was a barbarian. Catholics don't do that anymore. <laughs> it's a different church today. We had Pope John Paul, and he was smart. He was an intellectual. He got along with everybody. <laughs> the Catholic Church will never give up its claim to infallibility. Never. Thank you, thank you. Let me see what this little note says here. The uh, debate among SDA churches in my town, Seattle, is whether practicing cross-dressing homosexuals can be leaders, deacons, or teachers, or just members. <laughs> That's an interesting note. 
No, I can't say it's not happening. The brother just came up and said this is happening in my church where I'm from. I accept this at face value, okay? <laughs> now, I come from a town where the mayor is a cross-dresser. Yes! They elected that person twice, and he's up for re-election. Now, that town obviously is not a Christian town. But when this happens in the church, maybe somebody ought to say something. Now, we're supposed to love everybody, okay? We love everybody. It doesn't matter these weird things that go on. We love everybody, but we can't say God loves what they're doing. We can't say that one. We have to find out what's wrong and stay on the right side of issues. Or we may lose our Christianity. The Jesuit oath, the end justifies the means. That's it. Say what it takes to get elected. Oh, did I say that? <laughs> The Jesuit oath is the way politicians live. Who can trust a politician? Any politician. God's people are not to be involved in politics. It's against the gospel. Now I know that's hard on a few people because uh, here we are in the middle of the big political Storm! <laughs> oh, I've got to be loyal to my... <laughs> I'm sorry. Christians don't go there. God has told us, you don't belong to this world. Your, your home is another place. You are strangers here. You are pilgrims here. You are citizens of a better country. That makes you ambassadors for that country and not for this one. You try to be an ambassador for earth, you're wiping yourself out. The Religious Liberty Department just now put out a paper that tells our members we ought to vote Democratic because a Republican president is going to set up the wrong Supreme Court. Now, what in the world is going on that the leaders of our church want to tell people how to vote when God said don't vote at all? These are bigger issues than we've been led to believe. If some of our own leaders don't know what the Spirit of Prophecy said, maybe we need to look at our books a little more carefully. The Roman Catholic Church is not going to relinquish its claim to infallibility. Now I'm going to ask you, what is infallible? Well, we know God is, but what else is infallible? The Bible. His Word is infallible. Now, when you say the Bible is infallible, <laughs> how many of those can you have that are infallible? <laughs> <laughs> you see right away the devil has put the Catholic Church in the place of claiming infallibility and if we believe them we will have more than one Bible which is absolutely absurd you can't have two infallible Bibles I mean that's just simple 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 without going into the history the the mechanics and all the rest of it. Just one little thought. The Catholic Church, they're infallible, and we say we have an infallible Bible. And do you know, I think they understand that 
because they will allow the Catholic people to use any modern version they want, and it's okay. But if the people come to church with the King James, forget it. <laughs> you get out of here with that book. We don't use that book. <laughs> the Word of God. Josiah Strong wrote something that Ellen White co quotes here. Every cardinal, archbishop, and bishop in the Catholic Church takes an oath of allegiance to the Pope, in which occur the word, following words, heretics, schismatics, and rebels to our said Lord, the Pope, <laughs> or his aforesaid successors, I will to my utmost persecute and oppose. They are sworn to persecute you. Now how can we say we're going to vote some, for somebody in this country to pass laws of religious liberty that give them liberty to persecute me. Because that's what the Roman Catholic Church means by religious liberty. I have the right in my religion to persecute you, and I'm going to get the state to do it for me. So when you hear the word religious liberty, you better watch out who's talking. The Mormons, the same thing. The Mormons and the Catholics have gotten together for religious liberty purposes. You can go read that in the newspaper right now. Now you know what they mean by religious liberty. And our own religious liberty people are getting themselves confused. In the paper I read this week, it says religious liberty means I get to tell you about my religion. That's not religious liberty. Somebody is really confused. Religious liberty is I worship God between me and him and you have nothing to say about it. That's religious liberty. But as far as me telling you about my religion, I do not have that as a liberty and call it religious liberty. You have the right to your own opinions. Whether you want to hear me or not is your choice. I don't have the liberty to come after you and tell you everything I can about my religion. There are some mighty strange things going on in our own midst right now. Persecute and oppose. Reading from... Great controversy again. Romanism as a system is no more in harmony with the gospel of Christ now than in any former period in history. The Protestant churches are in great darkness or they would discern the signs of the time. Well, what is the Catholic Church doing? It's taking over governments everywhere in the world, including our own. They're moving into all the positions, including the Supreme Court. I'll read you what Ellen White says about this. She is employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world. Every day, this is what the Catholic Church is working on. All over the world, 
to regain control of the whole world. And this is not our subject today, but in another place, Ellen White says about God's people, they must prepare themselves for one last great conflict with the beast. There's going to be an active warfare between God's people and the Roman Catholic Church. Are you ready for it? <laughs> Are you ready to go out in the street and tell people, hey folks, wake up! The Catholic Church is going to get you the mark of the beast. We say, oh, I couldn't do that. They'll think I'm a nut. <laughs> well, it's true, they will. But not all of them. Because God has some of the people out there who want to know. And if nobody tells them, that's that. The people need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. This most dangerous foe. You know, Abraham Lincoln was a friend of uh, Chinoquee, the priest. Fifty years in the... Chinoquee was an interesting man. He got in trouble with Rome. They were going to do him in. They were going to send him to jail and get him so that nobody ever see him again. He knew too much. He was a priest. <laughs> and he left. He says, I'm not doing this anymore. This is against Jesus Christ. So he left, and they followed him. And they said, we're going to get you. And he was in big trouble with the courts, and he got Abraham Lincoln to defend him as a lawyer. <laughs> so Abraham Lincoln saw this happening. He says, no, 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 no. We're going to work with you. We're going to do what we can here. We're going to buck the whole Roman Catholic Church together. Yeah, Shinnequi. And of course, he got him off. <laughs> he got him off. But he didn't get the Catholic Church off his back. No, that didn't happen. To the present day, they're still after Shinnequi, and he's dead. You go on the websites, you look up Shinnequi, and you will find all the hate literature against him and all the literature that destroys his character says he was a liar, he was a thief, he was a cheat, he was a womanizer, he was... Who do you think put all that on the web? <laughs> That's right now, today. Well, one day he had a conversation with Abraham Lincoln. He says, you know... We have been through something very difficult facing down the Catholic Church. And he said, you, you got me off? And I really appreciate that. He said, but maybe you don't know what you did to yourself. <laughs> and Lincoln told him, yes, I know. <laughs> I know. He says, the only thing I want is to die at my post. He knew they were going to get him. And so he and Chinnakri had a heart-to-heart -heart talk. And Abraham Lincoln said, you know, people talk about religious liberty. I'm supposed to give religious liberty to people who want to destroy me and my wife and my family. I'm supposed to give them liberty to do that. He said, never. The Roman Catholics and the Mormons are the worst enemies of this country. Yeah, Lincoln named the Catholics and the Mormons, and now they're running for president, vice president. What would Lincoln do if he was here today? I don't think he'd be quiet. <laughs> Maybe the Protestants aren't the only people who have forgotten what the real world is like. <laughs> Have you been in a Roman Catholic church? 
It might surprise you if you're a wet inside of one. They have a feeling to them, those churches. You go in and you see the big stained glass windows. You see the, the beautiful paintings. You see the beautiful statuary. You see, your mind just goes, oh, <laughs> this, this is supernatural. If you, if you attend one of the services, you listen to the priest up there with his mumbo jumbo. Ooh, what's that? <laughs> then he says, hocus pocus. Hocus pocus. Bread turned into Jesus Christ. Hocus pocus. Hocus corpus meum. Hocus pocus. <laughs> No! They have beautiful choirs. Oh, you listen to their music and you're in heaven. Yeah. The artistry, the music, the buildings. It just, your mind goes, oh, this has to be from God. <laughs> oh, let me go hear the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. The devil knows what he's doing. And he calls it religious liberty. The current Supreme Court, six Catholic, three Jews. Well, I won't get into that. You know all that stuff. <laughs> if you want to really look into this stuff... You find out what the religion is of all the people in Congress. You may be shocked to see who's running this country. But that's not our subject. That is not our subject. How many people in that religion? Over a billion. It's way over a billion people. And it's not just because they have so many babies. People are joining that religion. Thank you. People are joining that religion. Why? Why do they like the Catholic Church? Because they love the stained glass windows. They love the music. They love the chanting. They love... The multitudes, the carnal, natural human mind loves the Catholic Church. Someone, another note, someone said at the church it's better that Romney be the president than Obama. That's terrible, that comment. We have no right to talk like that in church. I'm sorry. We have nothing to do with politics, Christians. Who is it that's talking like this? There's somebody that does not know the spirit of prophecy. And do you suppose it only happened in that church? Every church in this country is being worked by the devil right now. And somebody better start saying the truth. Because we are in trouble as a people. This is just one of the signs of that trouble. And do you know why it's happening? We're listening to the wrong spirit. There's a father. There's the son. And who else? The wrong spirit. Now, I've never said something to you here. Maybe I will just now in passing. Why we are getting ourselves in this situation in early writings 55 you all know what's on that page the father moved he moved from the holy place to the most holy place and a bunch of angels went with him and then Jesus moved 
to be where the father was. And somebody didn't move. <laughs> it was the devil. He appeared to be at the throne in the holy place. He appeared to be. Now, Ellen White, I think, says that for a reason. Because he really wasn't there. But somebody thought he was there. Now, when Jesus moved into the most holy place, the Seventh-day Adventists who were faithful followed him there by faith. And they said, Father, breathe upon us your spirit. And in early writings, it says, Jesus breathed on them. Did it say he gave them a third God? I'm sorry, it doesn't say that. He, he himself breathed on them his spirit. <coughs> and they felt power and love and peace. <coughs> the people who were still back there praying to the empty holy place because the Father and the Son were gone had only one person to answer their prayers. It was Satan. And they said, Father, breathe on us your spirit. And Satan did. And there was much power in it. But no sweet love and peace. That only goes to Christians. The devil is busy. He's busy. And he's faking out a whole bunch of people. He says, you pray to me and I will answer your prayer. I'm the third God. Yeah, I never said it to you that way before. <laughs> Don't you remember Isaiah? Don't you remember Isaiah 14? I will be like the Most High. I will be a God. Well, he did it. He did it. The Pentecostals worship that false God. I wonder how many of us have fallen into that same hole. Now we're telling people how to vote in elections that we're not even supposed to be voting at. The Catholic Church, religious liberty. We're losing track of what religious liberty is. <coughs> Heavy, she says, is the yoke which the carnal heart is willing to bear rather than to, bo to bow to the yoke of Christ. They'll let the Roman Catholic Church run them instead of having Jesus. Now, we know what they did in history, don't we? Millions of Christians killed and tortured by this Christian church. That's no Christian church. Has nothing to do with Jesus. We could spend months talking about the horrible atrocities that are in the history books. It is Satan's constant effort, I'm reading, it is Satan's constant effort to misrepresent the character of God, the nature of sin, and the real issues at stake in the great controversy. I haven't asked you this one yet. We're ready to ask a lot of interesting questions here. <laughs> what is the great controversy? Can you in one sentence tell me what the great controversy is? I mean, we've been at this a long time. <laughs> Can you say it in one sentence what the great controversy is?
The great controversy is, is Jesus really the Son of God? That's it. Satan in heaven said, I will not worship Christ. I do not believe he really is the Son of God. I will worship the Father, but I will not worship Jesus because I don't believe God can have a son. He's no better than me. He came from some place and I came from some place. That's the great controversy. And the Father and the Son came together in that council. Was there anybody else? The council of peace was between them both. <laughs> and Satan got really mad, didn't he? He said, I insist, I insist, this has to be a threesome. <laughs> and guess who he thought ought to be the third one? <laughs> And he has been there ever since. I'll fill that spot. And the Catholic Church gave it to the world. It's called the Trinity. Now this same Catholic Church we're talking about is the one that wants to destroy Seventh-day Adventism. And of course, they're the representative of Satan, so Satan's the one that's behind all of this. Get into this chapter. We're just touching the edges of some of these things. If we desire, I'm on page 569, if we desire to understand the determined cruelty of Satan manifested for hundreds of years not among those who never heard of God, but in the very heart and throughout the extent of Christendom, we have only to look at the history of Romanism through this mammoth system of deception. The prince of evil achieves his purpose to dishonor God and the wretchedness to man. We see how he succeeds in disguising himself and accomplishing his work through the leaders of the church. You better go home and read this book. I did not make up that sentence. <laughs> it's in your book. And don't you say, it could never happen to us. Don't you say that. We may better understand why he has so great an antipathy to the Bible. Did she say hate, Satan hates the Bible? Well, I believe that. <laughs> I believe he hates the Bible. If that book is read, the mercy and the love of God will be revealed. Are we reading that book? Are we really reading it? When I say we, I mean the Seventh Day Adventist people. I'm not talking to you and you and you. I know you're trying to do something. We're here. <laughs> We're together. We want to know. I'm talking about we, the Seventh Day Adventist Church, 15 million people. Are we reading the Bible? The Roman church now presents a fair front to the world, 
covering with apologies her record of horrible cruelties. And we know that's what John Paul did. He went around the world saying, oh, oh, we're so sorry. We need to be brethren. Come over here. Muslims, come on. Jews, come on. Protestants, come on. She has clothed herself in Christ-like garments, but she is unchanged. Every principle of the papacy that existed in the past ages exists today. The doctrines devised in the darkest ages are still held. Let none deceive themselves. The papacy that the Protestants now so readily honor is the same that ruled the world in the days of the Reformation. We all know what they did to people who disagreed with them then. Yeah, you could be asleep in your house at night and all of a sudden, here comes the army. They drag off your husband. They take him to a place and chain him and beat him and get him all ready. Then they put some green wood out there so it doesn't burn too hot and then they burn him to death. For what? He has a Bible in his house. You can't do that. In one night, they did 50,000 Protestants. One night. And when the Catholic Pope heard about it, he said, let the bells ring. This is our glorious time. We got rid of them. This is not just history we're talking about here. We're talking about what's coming to this world again. Because if they haven't changed, just as soon as they can, they're going to do it again. And their big target is going to be the Seventh-day Adventists because we're the only ones, at least some of us, who will not compromise. We'll see it all the way through. If we have to go to the rock, to the stake, to that burning, let's go. Shall this power, whose record for a thousand years is written in the blood of the saints, be now acknowledged as a part of the Church of Christ? <laughs> see? see, people don't know any of this out there. They don't know. Now, she said a thousand years. Why did she say a thousand years? We go by these sentences too fast. Why did she say for a thousand years? Well, she used that terminology someplace else in this book. Where was that? Oh, yeah, she was talking about the Walden Seas. She says for a thousand years God kept the word of God pure through these people. And then in the chapter of Wycliffe, she said in the 14th century, when Wycliffe stood up to give us the pure language, well, if you go back a thousand years, where does that take you? The 4th century. 14th? 4th? The 4th century is the 300s. 321, the first Sunday law. 325, the Council of Nicaea. At that same time, Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, the Roman Catholic Bibles. She says paganism marched into the church. Do we hold to any of that paganism today? We need to really begin understanding if we are part of religious liberty or we're part of the way the Catholics and the Mormons believe it. As the Protestant churches have been seeking the favor of the world, false charity has blinded their eyes. 
They don't see, but that it's right to call good evil and call evil good. Why do you suppose they don't like the Sabbath? <laughs> because they're Catholics. The Catholics hate the Sabbath. They now, as it were, are apologizing to Rome for their uncharitable bigotry. <laughs> and they are begging pardon for their bigotry. Can you see it? The, more, the, the Protestant church is begging the Catholics to say, oh, uh, you have to forgive us for not thinking you were nice. <laughs> Carla Maria Martini. You know the name? The Catholic Cardinal? The Bishop? The Archbishop of Milan? The super intellectual of the Catholic Church? Was on the translation committee of the Greek Nestle Bible. That's supposed to be a Reformation work, but it had a Roman Catholic on it. He just died. He died in August. Do you think people who know the history of Catholicism should be using Nestle's book? A prayer full of this Bible would show Protestants the real character of the papacy and would cause them to abhor and shun it. But many are so wise in their own conceit they feel no need of humbly seeking God that they may be led into the truth. They are ignorant both of the Scriptures and the power thereof. Yeah. Yeah, we go to church. Where's the power? We go through the forms. We sing. We stand up and down. We pray. Where's the power? They must have some means of quieting their consciences. And they seek that which is least spiritual and humiliating. What they desire is a method of forgetting God. Can you believe it? People going to church so they can forget God? Now, does that word strike anything in your brain? Forget. Now, that's the devil's plan. Forget. What does God say? <laughs> Remember! Remember what the great controversy is all about. Jesus is the Son of God. <laughs> See? Who's talking about that? Who's making an issue out of that? Who knows about it? Well, that kind of religion makes two kinds of people. People who want to be saved by their own merits. I'm getting better and better. I look at myself every day to see how I'm doing. Someday I'll get good. <laughs> Does any of that sound familiar? <laughs> That's the Roman Catholic Church. And there's another kind of person. They want to be saved in their sins. Oh, I will never overcome. I'm going to be saved by faith. That's all. I will never give up sin. God has to save me in my sin. You better go home and read Great Controversy. It's all in there. Two kinds of people that are going to be lost that will be like the Roman Catholics. Saved in their own merits, 
by how good they are or saved in their sins, I can't overcome. Thank you. Thank you. In past ages, when men were without God's word and without the knowledge of the truth, their eyes were blind and folded. In this generation, there are many whose eyes become dazzled by the glare of human speculations. Now I'm going to read you a sentence we've all read, but we kind of skipped over it. Science falsely so-called, they discern not the net. Now we always go someplace that won't harm us too much. So we say that means evolution. But that's not what Ellen White said. Science, falsely so called, it's called higher criticism. It's called changing the Greek text. It's called modern versions. It's called, shall I continue the list for you? <laughs> She saw all of this, but people say, oh, she never wrote about this. There it is! Science falsely so called. Aleph. B. C. Codex. What do those names mean to us? It's that science, that false science. They've given all these names to all these different versions of corrupt Greek text and made their new Bibles out of them. And the, the layman sits here saying, what do you mean, Aleph? <laughs> what do you mean, Codex Sinaitica? What do you mean, Riley? What do you mean, Chester Beatty? What do you mean, <laughs> Leningrad? No, you don't know anything about any of those. Why should you? <laughs> it has nothing to do with God. But the whole scholarly world has bit it and chewed it and said, well, we know you're just ignorant. <laughs> Jesus called himself the Son of Man. Yes, yes, that was his favorite title for himself. Why did he do that? Because he had two natures. He was the Son of God from all eternity. And when he became in the flesh, now he called himself the Son of Man. Why did he become the Son of Man? He came to show us how a human who has the Spirit of the Father in him lives. That's what he came for to show us how a true son loves the true father. You can't get that any other way. I'm sorry. You can't get it from theology. You have to get the spirit of Jesus in you, and then you will have the same spirit that loved the father in him in you. Science falsely so called. When pride and ambition are cherished and men exalt their own theories above the word of God, then intelligence can accomplish greater harm than ignorance. Thus, the false science of the present day, which undermines faith in the Bible, will prove as successful in preparing the way for the acceptance of the papacy with its pleasing forms as is the withholding of knowledge in the dark ages. So what have these wonderful intellects done in this science falsely so-called? What are they accomplishing? They're making Catholics of everybody that believes them. That includes everybody that uses Nestle's Greek text. And I'm not going to tell you again who does that.
Protestant in Protestant America. They're opening the doors to the Catholic Church. They're doing it. The Catholics don't need to do a thing. The Protestants are accomplishing that. And that which gives greater significance to this movement is the fact that the principal object contemplated is the enforcement of Sunday observance. Do you see why we exist? We're supposed to know all of this and help people see what the issues are. And it's not Sunday or Saturday. It's what the Catholic Church is doing under Satan to get rid of Jesus as the Son of God. Now she says this, and I don't, I haven't found anybody who understands what she just said here. She says, the enforcement of Sunday observance, a custom which originated with Rome. And our teachers teach the su Sunday was made up by the Catholics. That's not what she said. Because they didn't make it up. She said the enforcement that's the issue, not Sunday. The enforcement by a secular power. We mustn't turn our attention from the reality here. Let me read it again. The, the principal object contemplated is the enforcement of the Sunday movement, a custom. The enforcement is the custom. Church, state. That's the custom. That's how you get enforcement. A veneration of human traditions. Royal edicts, general councils, church ordinances sustained by secular power were the steps by which the pagan festival attained its position in, of honor in the Christian world. The what? The pagan festival. So we're not talking about going to church on this day or that day. We're talking about a pagan festival. That means worshiping Satan. Now, obviously, there are a lot of people who don't know these things. And God accepts them where they are. But do you know there's a real danger in that? Because God cannot take people into eternity who were just ignorant. That's not the issue. The issue is, could they have known? That's the issue. And who is going to tell God, there's no way I could have known anything about this. And he's just going to have to ask them, did you have a Bible? <laughs> What's anybody going to say? Well, I only had 15 of them in the front room and two more in the bedroom and in the car I had a couple. What excuse can anybody make up to give God about anything that's going to work? Eusebius, the fellow who put together Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, he said, we have changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Do you think he didn't know what they did? <laughs> he said, we have changed it. And then they tried to do it in the Bible, but God wouldn't allow that. He wouldn't allow it. He said, you leave that just the way it reads, seventh day. But do you know what the modern churches have done? You have to read these Bibles carefully. It doesn't say the seventh day. It says a seventh day. One in seven. You ask any Sunday keeping minister today about the Sabbath, and they'll tell you, we keep the Sabbath. It's called Sunday. We keep one day in seven. <laughs> and you say, where'd you get that? My Bible. That's what it says. Their Catholic Bible.
I have on my wrist a watch that I ordered from Europe. I couldn't find the kind of a watch I wanted here. I wanted one with the days of the week on it. So I, my brain is getting to the place where I don't even remember what day it is anymore. <laughs> so I have to look and say, oh, today's Wednesday. <laughs> today's Thursday. But the thing I didn't count on, it's a European watch. When I received it, the week begins with Monday. And ends on Sunday. And I said, oh! <laughs> I can't show my watch to a person and say, what's the first day of the week? Monday. <laughs> the devil is getting us ready! <laughs> Maybe I, I'm not going to tell that story. I have to keep moving here. You read this for yourself. She describes the exaltation of Sunday through the gradual development of the papacy. I want to get to what we are supposed to be doing today. We now have the introduction. Dies Domini. Have any of you read that? Dies Domini, 37 pages by Pope John Paul on why Christians keep Sunday. Yeah. It has all the arguments the Sunday keepers use, the Protestant Sunday keepers. They don't know they're using Catholic arguments. And he says in the middle of it, we changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. <laughs> They're taking credit. They're taking credit. So now I'm moving past several pages to remind you of some things we've already talked about. A striking illustration of Rome's policy toward those who disagree with her was given in the long and bloody persecution of the Waldenses. That name should stir something in you, the Waldenses. They were the first people to receive a translation of the Bible in their own language. They had the ancient faith of the apostles, the pure Bible, and they kept it for a thousand years pure while the Catholic Church was corrupting the Bible in their line. The Walden Seas. Do you know what? God has kept that Bible pure through the Reformation through the English language. God left the Germans as the Church of God and he put it in the English language. It went over to Wycliffe. Wycliffe. People sometimes tell me I say it wrong. That's okay. <laughs> I'm not in England right now. We have that English line developing and we have the Erasmus text being made available. We have a history in Bohemia of Huss. We have the Hussites moving to Germany before Luther comes on the scene. They had the pure Bible in Germany before Luther. And so God continues that. And the Reformation moved to England. Then it moved to Scotland. Then it moved to Ireland. All English language. Why was he doing that? So that when he started his last movement on earth in America, they would have a pure Bible. God did all that for the Seventh-day Adventists. How dare a Seventh-day Adventist say, that Bible's no good.
We are the Walden Seas now. We are what's left of the Walden Seas. And there are not many of us left anymore. Yeah. But God's going to finish this work because there are still Walden Seas on this planet. God kept it alive in Central Africa. He kept it alive in other places in the world, in Abyssinia. The Catholics followed him around, tried to kill him wherever they could find him. And of course, many of the Waldenses gave up the whole idea. They didn't like being killed all the time. So they finally said, it's not worth it. But the real ones found those places in the mountains, and God protected them. And they continued to do the work. It has been shown that the United States is the power described by the lamb-like horns. This prophecy will be fulfilled when the United States shall enforce Sunday observance. When's the last time you thought about the wonderful morality of the legislators of this country? <laughs> Every time you pick up a newspaper, somebody's flying across the country to be with their girlfriend. And every time you turn around, pork isn't a good name anymore. They just flat out steal money. Morality? What's that? Constitution? What's that? Democracy? What's that? Republic? What's that? Defending the laws that have been written? What's that? We make them as we go along. The church is not the only thing that's in trouble. This country has sold out. There is no more United States of America. We get two people put up in front of us and, and the people are told, you vote for the next president. What a joke. Who gave us those two people? <coughs> The people had nothing to do about it. They got two people put in front of them by somebody else, and they were given that choice. <clears throat> All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. In both the old and the new world, the papacy will receive homage in the honor paid to the Sunday institution that rests solely upon authority of the Roman Church. Marvelous in her shrewdness and cunning is the Roman Church. She can read what's to be. She bides her time. <laughs> She knows she has to win because people are too stupid not to see what's happening. The Roman Catholic Church with all the, its ramifications throughout the world forms one vast organization. Yeah. That's powerful. One vast organization. And of course people joke and they say, well, they don't pay attention to the Pope. We do contraceptives anyhow. And the Catholic Church comes on the scene and says, it's against the Constitution for the United States government to pay for contraceptions. They're ruining our religion. What a bunch of baloney. 
The only thing this government has done so far is said we will make money available so whoever wants it can get some for contraceptives. They didn't tell anybody they had to take it. But the Catholic Church says you're ruining our religion. That's ridiculous. But people who have up the party spirit will hear it the Catholic way. They're going to defend their party. That's not Christianity, okay? It's not religious freedom. History testifies of her artful and persistent efforts to insinuate herself into the affairs of nations. Who's going to deny that? <laughs> into the affairs of nations. Let it remember... That the boast of Rome is she never changes. She never changes. The principles of Gregory the Seventh and Innocent the Third are still the principles of the Roman Catholic Church. Rome is aiming to reestablish her power to recover her lost supremacy. And the interesting thing is she's going to get this done by getting the people to vote her people into office. They made an image to the beast. Did you pick up the word they? The people. <laughs> they got the choices put up in front of them and the Catholic was in both of them. <laughs> they said, go ahead, vote, vote. We win any way you go. <laughs> God's word has given warning of the impending danger. Let this be unheeded and the Protestant world will learn what purposes of Rome really are only when it is too light to escape the snare. She is silently growing in power. Her doctrines are exerting her influence in legislative halls, in churches, and in the hearts of men. She is piling up massive structures in the secret recesses of her former, and her per former persecutions will be repeated. What is the Catholic Church doing? What did she just say? Hidden in buildings and churches here and there. She's setting up the torture chambers again. She's getting ready. She knows what she wants to do. All that she desires is vantage ground, and this is already being given to her. We shall soon see and shall feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur reproach and persecution. So when you hear people talking about religious liberty, you better pay attention because it probably isn't religious liberty at all. It's religious liberty for the Catholics to persecute. And it's religious liberty to keep you away from them so you can't evangelize anybody. This is a wake-up chapter. This is a wake-up chapter. You're not just supposed to say, oh, well, I guess we should not join that unpleasantness. The word is abhor. Abhor. It's the devil. Shun it. And let people know what's going on. Obviously, you can't say everything to people, so get some literature together that you can hand people who are interested so they can read it. You know, if they get mad at a book and throw it down, what happens next? They have to pick it up again. <laughs> That's why we have the literature we have. God will use it, but we've got to get it into their hands first. Okay, I think that's all we'll say today because my mind is already leading me into another meeting. <laughs> I think we better leave it alone right here.
Worship God between you and Him. Don't let the church get in between. You don't like that one, do you? <laughs> you know what happens when you let the church get in between? They will send you letters from headquarters saying, you vote Democratic because a Republican president will get us in trouble in the Supreme Court. That's this week, right now. Now, I hope you don't misinterpret me. I don't care about Republicans or Democrats. They're both the same to me. They're of this world. We belong to a better country. We are ambassadors to this world. And they owe us as ambassadors to treat us like they would treat God. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you that your plan is going forward. Nothing can stop it. Your purposes are going to be fulfilled. You're trying to wake us up. You're trying to warn us of what the issues are here so that we can help somebody else understand. All of this has to happen before Jesus comes back. We're not going to avoid it. But the only way we're going to be on the winning side is to receive the Spirit of Jesus. When we have His Spirit, we will learn how to live like Him and to do what you've asked us to do. We thank you that we cannot fail if we stay with you. We thank you in Jesus' holy name for that. Amen.